Hey writers, you're listening to the Kobo Writing Life podcast, where we bring you insights and inspiration for growing your self-publishing business. We're your hosts. I'm Laura, Kobo Writing Life's author engagement manager. And I'm Rachel, the promotion specialist at Kobo Writing Life. On today's episode of the podcast, we spoke to Grace Calloway, a USA Today and international bestselling author of hot and heart-melting historical romance. Her career was launched with her debut novel, Her Husband's Harlot, which was a finalist for the Romance Writers of America Golden Heart Award and a number one national bestselling Regency romance. Since then, her books have continued to top the historical romance bestselling charts and retailers everywhere. As a big romance reader, I really enjoyed our conversation with Grace. We talked to her about her publishing journey, how indie publishing has changed since her, her start in 2011, her love of all things historical romance, and the research that goes into her books. We also talked about her new release, which is Glory in the Master of Shadows. Hi, everyone. We're joined today by USA Today bestselling historical romance author Grace Calloway. Hi, Grace. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, Can you kick us off by telling us a little bit about yourself? Oh, hi. I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me to be on your podcast. So as you mentioned, I write historical romance, and I've been doing it for about Oh my gosh, like a little over 10 years. So my historical romances are super steamy. I've got about 20 of them and they're in different series, but they're all set in the same universe. So they take place in Regency and Victorian England, although, you know, it's kind of a my own world that I created. So there's some different elements as well. There's a lot of mystery and adventure. Yeah. So that's kind of what I do. And it's been great fun. You mentioned you've been publishing for almost 10 years now. Can you tell us a little bit about your publishing journey and why you decided to take the indie publishing route? Yeah, it's actually kind of interesting. I think I came into publishing at a really interesting time. So I wrote my first book in 2009. And back then, like indie wasn't, it was sort of becoming a thing, but it wasn't really a thing yet. Actually, my profession is I'm a clinical psychologist. And writing was really just kind of a hobby and stress relief for me. After giving birth to my first, well, my child, my son, who has some pretty significant special needs, I actually started writing as just like something that I just did for me for fun. So I'd, you know, come home from the hospital and I'd be like working on this book. Anyway, that book took me about a year to write. And then I was like, oh, well, I wonder if this is something that could get published. So I submitted the book to back then, you know, agents were kind of the only route to publishing. And I like had no idea about the publishing world at all. It was just, I read a lot of romances and just struck me as something that was kind of like this fun dream job to do. So I got accepted by an agent who began shopping the book around. And then a little bit after that, that book finaled in the Romance Writers of America. Back then they had... I don't know if they still have it, this Golden Heart contest for unpublished people. So it's kind of like everything started happening at once. But my agent could not sell my book. And the feedback from, I think back then there were seven big publishers or 10, I can't remember. You know, things have changed so much in the last like 10 years. It's kind of insane when you think about it. But um, the feedback was people really liked, thought I had an interesting voice. They really liked it, but they literally could not figure out what to do with it because my work did not fit neatly in any sort of box. Like it's super steamy, but it also, you know, it's historical set, but it has like a lot of mystery and adventure. And they're just like, what do we do with this? Simultaneously, I had some really good friends who had started like honestly killing it in indie. You know, they were sort of at like the ground level with the whole indie publishing thing. And they were like, well, Grace, why don't you try to self-publish? And I was still like hemming and hawing because I'm a hemming and hawing kind of person. So I was like, finally, okay, well, we'll see what happens. Like I've got nothing to lose. So I put that first book, which is her husband's harlot up. And like within, I think like a month or two, it hit number one in a genre. And I was like, okay, I was not like it's expecting this. <laughs> this is kind of strange. So that's kind of how I got started. But I didn't commit to writing full time for a really long time because I still had this career as a clinical psychologist, which 
you know, that's another story. There's a real struggle to kind of give that up because I really love my work. I found that very meaningful. And so anyway, I continued releasing kind of slowly. And, you know, like that was 2000. 10. So actually, no, I've been doing this for 13 years. Sorry, it's 2023. I lost a few years in the pandemic. Yeah. So now, you know, whatever, 13 years later, I've got like 20 something books. So that's kind of been my journey. I went full time, like fully 100% writing only in about 2018. Although 2014, I cut back at the hospital significantly. So that's been my journey. It's been amazing. I can't believe I get to do this full time. It's just the greatest job in the world. How's your release schedule changed at all since you've been going from full-time versus part-time? So in a perfect world, I would like to release two books a year, which probably doesn't sound like a lot (laughs) to some (laughs) writers who are very prolific, including some of my friends, and I'm just sort of in awe. For me to write the kind of books that I write, which are very, my books are long, you know, they're like 100,000 words. They're historical, so I have to do like a lot of research. I mean, my latest release is like historical Chinese and like English, so I have to do like a lot of research for that. So I think, you know, when I was working full time, I was doing maybe like one book every year, year and a half. So I am so grateful to my readers who like waited for me. Um, They've been amazing. So when I'm really on, I'm like two books a year. For the last couple of years, because of the pandemic, I've been like a book every eight to nine months, just because my, you know, my childcare like issues. And I just want to make sure the book gets the time that it needs. So I'm trying to do two books a year. I feel like the pandemic really kind of like either threw a wrench in a lot of people's writing schedules or just like freed up everything. There's like no in between. The past couple of years have been wild. Yeah, no, it's been crazy. I mean, it's weird because I feel like the first year, oh my, how, how how long has this pandemic been going on? I think the first year or two, I felt like super creative. Like it was my outlet. Like I'm just like, I was like, okay, I need to like immerse myself in this fantasy world. Like the end is nigh. Like I've just got to like pour myself into this and send out like, you know, for my readers too, like a world that they can escape to. I feel like we all really needed that, especially at the at the first year or two. And then the last year has been a little bit harder because it's kind of like the little bit, oh, Bo has joined us. You know, it's just been a little bit more of the like real world coming back. There's always like the practical things. You know, if my kid is not in school, then I have problems getting writing time in. You mentioned kind of the fantasy historical element of your writing, how it's kind of an escape. Have you always been kind of drawn to historical romance as a reader as well? And was there one author who specifically kind of drew you in? So I love historical romance. I mean, that's what I primarily read when actually it's really funny because I have this very concrete memory of like, I went to the University of Michigan and back then, that's where Borders was headed in Ann Arbor. And it had this like huge Borders bookstore, which is where I went to work on my dissertation. But instead of working on my dissertation, I would go to the romance section. It was so much more interesting than like dealing with all this research. So the books that really inspired me as a reader, starting off with like Amanda Quicks, you know, she wrote some great historicals that had a lot of that mystery element in it, in them. And I just really loved those books. You know, I think my early love of historicals was her and Lisa Kleypas, of course, Loretta Chase, kind of like the classics of historical romance in the 80s and 90s. Do you still read in the genre or now that you've started to write your own historical romance, do you find it can be hard to separate the two? Yeah, that's exactly it. I find it very hard to read what I'm writing. So I have not read a lot of historical romance lately. You know, it's just, yeah, it's kind of an interesting thing. I've heard other writers talk about it. They don't really kind of read what they write. But it was really great seeing Bridgerton get all that exposure (laughs) and like just, you know, seeing the love of historical kind of come back. I mean, it was such a big thing in the 80s. I think that's when I first kind of encountered them, some of the bodice rippers and other (laughs) steamy books. But I'm glad it's coming back. Do you find yourself connecting with a lot of other historical romance authors online? Like, what's that community like? I think romance authors in general are a very generous 
and like welcoming and wonderful group, really more than any other profession I've been a part of. Although I guess I've only been part of two professions and psychologists are very nice too. But, um, <laughs> you know, like just with writers, you just kind of speak the same language, you know? So yeah, I have, you know, a lot of friends in the historical romance community and they're certainly like wonderful. I was just part of an anthology called Duke in a Box, which I just thought was the greatest title ever. Um, Such a good title. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And actually credit to that goes to Darcy Burke, who is um, a fabulous historical romance author. So, you know, we all kind of wrote short stories for this anthology and we marketed it together, you know, and shared our audiences. And I thought it was like a wonderful thing. So there's a lot of collaboration going on, I think, within historical romance. But then also just within romance in general, I have um, a lot of good friends who write in other genres. You know, we do a lot of like yearly retreats and we just came back from Carlsbad not so long ago. And it was, you know, a blast, like 15 romance writers like writing on the beach. So it's great. Like, you know, and it's a combination of things. I think as an indie author, you know, there's a craft aspect of it. So I have friends who are like just fantastic at brainstorming and I can go to them with like, okay, I like am stuck here. I need to figure out like, you know, what is this clue that needs to be discovered here in order for this yada yada to happen? And they can like come up with an answer right away, right? Like they totally, we can speak in shorthand, you know, whereas, you know, my husband, who's also a writer, he's a poet, but he doesn't read romance. So it's a little harder for him. I'm like, you know, so if it's like a grumpy sunshine situation, like when he's, and he's like, what are you talking about? So, you know, romance, I think authors and readers have a shorthand, right? So it's wonderful to do that. But I think where I was also going was with my indie author friends, there's also like a big business component of it, right? Because you're basically a small publisher, you're an entrepreneur. And so, you know, at our retreat, we did a lot of the craft stuff, but we also talked a lot, a lot about, you know, business and marketing and all that fun stuff which is ever-changing in the indie world. That's one thing we hear a lot when talking about the indie author community, especially the romance author community, is that everybody is so just open and willing to let you know what works for them, understanding that like what works for one author might not work for the other, but they're willing to let you know what's working for them so you can give it a shot. And I, I don't know, it's always so heartwarming to hear that it's true. Yeah, and I think, you know, part of it is that it's a community of women. (laughs) To be very, like... I love having all these women friends and I just feel like women can be like incredibly supportive of one another and we're all doing something we love and we all understand that, you know, when one person succeeds, it's like, you know, we all do, right? A lot of it is, I think, raising visibility of romance, although it's crazy because romance is so by far the best selling genre. So like, how much visibility do we need? But for us to be considered, you know, taken seriously for what we do. And it's very interesting for me because in my other life, I was, you know, people addressed me as Dr. So-and-so. And And then when I, now when I introduce myself, I'm like, oh, I'm a romance writer. And it's a little bit of a different reaction depending on who you're talking to. And I'm like, it surprises me because to me, this is like, I just love romance so much. It is like the best thing in the world to be doing, to be able to, you know, make a living creating stories that like lift and inspire people. I mean, how much, just a wonderful job. Yeah, I I really agree. And I think it's getting a little bit better now, but there used to be like a really big stigma around being a romance reader. And I think maybe since COVID, we're seeing people kind of embrace more. And like since COVID and also since Bridgerton, I think kind of brought it more mainstream. We're seeing a lot of people kind of learn more about the romance genre and kind of embrace the tropes that they're into. And book talk has changed this a little bit too. So it's always good to see. But yeah, there is still a little bit of that stigma when you say you read a lot of romance, people are kind of like quick to judge. Yeah, it's strange because I've always been so happy to say, oh, I love romance. It's the only thing I read. I don't know what it is. It's like, I almost feel like it's, it's this cultural thing of like, you know, because romance values like the happy ending and the fantasy that this is somehow like simple or like whatever, but that's what I want, you know, especially right now, like we could all use a happy ending right now. I I don't need to meet, read like a lot of depression fiction, (laughs) but I've always kind of been like that. And I think, I personally think this is because of 
indie publishing, the diversity that's available in romance now is like greater than it's ever been before. I think in like the history of romance and, you know, diverse books, I mean, like anything, it could be, you know, like my next book, which is features, you know, multicultural characters or like queer books or books about sci-fi monsters. I mean, I just love that writers can write what they want and they can find there's an audience for it. You know, so I just think romance is actually very complex and like evolving and wonderful. And I'm going to take a hard left turn into writing romance because I want to talk to you about your writing process, especially with historical romance, because you mentioned off the top that like it involves a lot of research um, in order to make your books historically accurate. So I'm really curious how your research process and your writing process kind of mesh. Like, do you have an idea for a book and when you want to set it? and then research or do you research and find something and be like, oh, that'd be cool. So even though I have one, two, I have four series. Yeah, I'm on my fourth series. <laughs> they actually all happen on the same timeline set in the same universe. So it's sort of almost dictated now, like, and I'm in second generation characters. So like her birth date was set like eight books ago or something, my current heroine. So there are a lot of things already decided for me. But my very first book, I said in Regency because I was reading a lot of Regency. And in retrospect, I kind of wish I'd said it like a little earlier in the Regency because that book was set, Her Husband's Harlot was set in like 1818. So I really only had like one series that could take place in the Regency. And then I was like the in-between between Regency and um, Victorian. But so like now the historical setting is sort of determined by where I am in my story universe. But I think like for this current book, because it had some elements of like China in the 1830s, I definitely read a lot before I started writing because I felt like I didn't know enough to write the story. And it's not just like information, like I'm not, I try not to do too much info dumping in, but I think where it really becomes important is kind of understanding the character, which is where I always begin and their point of view, which is so culturally informed, right, by like where they're from. And, you know, what time in history it is. So I do a lot of reading before. And then, you know, during things always come up. Like, you know, in the middle of this book, I was like, I should probably read the Tao Te Ching, like, now. So, you know, but that's actually what I love, because I'm a bit of a nerd. Um, I love the research. I love learning about new things. I mean, this is why writing will never bore me, because there's, like, infinite things to explore. So, you know, when I do research, it's not just like the historical research, it's like research about, you know, I mean, it can be like about clothing and like historical things, but there's so many research rabbit holes, I can't even. In fact, this is probably a tip for someone who is interested in writing historical romance. I mean, I think it's important to do some background reading before you start, so you generally know what you're talking about. But if there's a way for you to kind of save the research as you go along, like to compartmentalize it a little bit and not stop every time like you're in your manuscript, that will help you get your book done a lot quicker. And that took me about 18 books to figure out. So you're welcome. (laughs) That's great advice. Save you from falling down wild Wikipedia holes mid-sentence. Oh my God. Like, you know, it could be something like, I'm like, oh, he was unlocking a door. And I'm like, one sec, did the Chinese, what kind of Chinese locks were there in like 1836? And so I'm like researching the history of Chinese locks, which go way back, by the way. So I was fine. (laughs) It's just like, there are so many little things that if you research everything as you go along, it will take you a long time. And the thing I always say is, I'm a mad reviser. Like I will revise, 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 like up until the very last minute that I can upload this book, I will be tweaking it. So you can always take care of that later, for sure. And especially as an indie author, you can kind of just go in and fix stuff whenever. So it's nice to have that control too. That's true. Yes. Yes. You have a lot of control as an indie author for better or for worse. (laughs) Yeah, that's also true. So we wanted to talk about your series, Lady Charlotte Society of Angels, which is kind of a historical romance spin on Charlie's Angels. So can you tell us how that series came to be? I think this series is sort of like 
a culmination of just like who I am, honestly, like mishmashing like a bunch of cultural influences. So I love Charlie's Angels growing up. This is going to age me, but that's fine. Yeah. So I loved, I like, yes, I wanted to be Kelly. It's all good. She was so glamorous. So I love them. I've always loved like, like Nancy Drew type characters, like the female detectives. I mean, all my books have had like kind of female solving crime, but then it was kind of perfect because now I have this, the second generation of like, young women who were brought up to be pretty independent because their moms were all very spirited as well right so i was just like this is like the perfect setup where you know they are just like curious they're intelligent they want to do good in the world yeah it just kind of fit everything that i like to do so that's how it came about really i think and your latest release is the next installment in this series, Glory and the Master of Shadows. Can you give us a brief spoiler-free synopsis? Oh, that's hard. And I'm so close to it right now. But I will say, actually, I think what kind of encapsulates like the concept of it, it's kind of Charlie's Angel meets like Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. So there's a lady detective and there's a martial arts Shifu, our hero, and he's on this secret quest for vengeance and she's on this case and their past interacts and then it's like mayhem from, from you know, they're on basically. But yeah, it's, it's, you know, there's crime fighting, there's a dog napping to be solved, you know, there's, you know, quest for vengeance to be fulfilled there's a lot going on and there's some very steamy scenes. So it was so much fun to write. I think that's a great synopsis. I think you nailed it. Oh, and cool. <laughs> so you and I met at 20 books in Vegas. And when we were chatting, you were so excited about the cover of this book because it's your first cover where both the hero and the heroine are Asian. And the cover is beautiful. We will make sure there's a link to it or like a photo of it in the show notes because it's stunning. And I'm just so curious, how did this cover come to be? Thank you, first of all, because I am in love with the cover. So there's, you know, a lot of different ways to get covers made. Um, you can use stock art or whatever. When it comes to finding Asian historical stock art, good luck, everybody. So there's a market for this if anyone's interested. So a good friend of mine, Jen LeBlanc, who also writes historical romance, does custom cover shoots. So it was really fun, actually. I got to cast the models myself. So she sent me like headshots of, you know, different people. So I got to pick my glory and way. And I had some ideas for poses, although I'm going to credit her with the ultimate pose. So there's this thing when you're advertising a book, right? You have to kind of think about, is it advertisable? Because there's certain, you know, constraints, depending on the platform you're using to advertise in terms of the cover. And so initially I was like, oh, well, I'm going to have to do, you know, a pretty like maybe they're holding hands or like whatever, and he'll have a shirt on. And I do have some like, you know, versions like that, but she also took this one and I was like, I don't even care if I can market it. This is like, <laughs> this is the one and I am completely in love. They just both look gorgeous. They both look so into each other. So I choose all the poses for all of my covers. You know, a lot of it for me is like finding the right chemistry that speaks to me, like about whether that respect like looks like the couple to me. So yeah, it was a custom shot and I'm so happy with it. It turned out really great. Yeah, I really like it. And Rachel and I were talking about it earlier and how we like Way's arms. He looks really good. <laughs> yeah, the shirtless thing like actually <laughs> added a lot. To, I mean, and it's, kind of how I imagined him. So I was like, oh yeah, this is genius. And my cover artist, Erin, did an, an amazing job, obviously, with the colors and everything. So yeah, it's a great combination of the photo and then the art as well. Was something else that we wanted to talk about for anyone listening, Rachel and I just finished the book. So we're both are really excited to talk about it. But one of the things that we wanted to talk about was the fight scenes because they're so realistic. So how do you kind of block these out? And do you have any tips for writers who are attempting to add scenes like these to their books? Oh, do I block them out? No, I just screwed my loins before I have to write them. <laughs> I don't know. I just kind of figured out how to do it, I guess. I mean, I always like when I'm preparing to do it, I think what can 
be helpful is if you micro plot out a little bit, like the sequence of physically what's happening. But I don't know, maybe I watch a lot of like shows with fighting <laughs> or something. It comes very naturally to me, as by the way, do the sex scenes, which people always ask me about. I don't know. I love writing both, so I have no problem doing it, honestly. <laughs> So maybe the tip is everyone needs to watch more action movies before they write. <laughs> that can become part of the research process. <laughs> yeah, well, and for me, for this book, I watched a lot of Cantonese period kung fu movies growing up. Like, I grew up on this, so this is part of what informed this book, too, is just, like, my lifelong love of, like, martial arts dramas. Do you have any kung fu movies you would recommend for those of us who really enjoy that genre as well? I would say my favorite story is Legend of the Condor Heroes, which has like, I don't know, 20 versions of it. <laughs> so I'm not sure which is the current one, but it's like a classic um, written by, what's his English name? So his Chinese name is Gam Yong, and he's like a famous novelist. Um, but I think that's his pen name. I think his real name was like Louis, Louis Cha, maybe? But he wrote like a lot of martial arts fiction and they all got made into movies. And they're amazing. I think there is a Condor Heroes maybe available on Amazon or something, but it's in Mandarin, which, but I think it's subtitled. Yeah, but the version I watched growing up, I don't think it's around anymore. It was like the 80s version. And they somehow managed to have like 80s hair, even though it was set in like, you know, China and the like, whatever, 500s. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. Uh, a period piece with poofy bangs is... Totally. And like blue eyeshadow. It was <laughs> everything. It's amazing. I am going to be looking into this later today. So thank you very much. <laughs> You're welcome. Another thing I found really interesting in the book is that, like you mentioned, it has a lot of like Cantonese and Chinese influences and not a lot of, but like a handful of words or honorifics that are in the English version of Chinese words and they're italicized without any explanation, which I thought was really cool. And I really enjoyed what... I guess, was the decision-making process behind this? Well, the decision has not been decided yet, actually, because I still, I do have a glossary that I, I've been kind of going back and forth. And actually, I would love your input on this because I want it to be, obviously, I want the English reader to be able to understand, you know, the words. But I also kind of feel like the words should be understandable from context. And there's something about when you have to have a glossary for me as a reader, I'm like, it takes me out. Like, I don't need to, I don't want to like have to look at the glossary to be like, what is this word? So I tried very hard to make it clear from the context what the words meant. And I also didn't want to have to do too much explanation in the book, though, because when you're in the person's POV, clearly, like, they know what this word means. So there's a lot of like decisions that, you know, come about when you're um, adding a foreign language to a novel. So I guess my question for you is, did you understand what those words meant from the context? I mean, if not the exact definition, then the context of, in which the word was used made it clear what it was intended to mean. If not like a direct translation, in my personal opinion, I okay. understood what was happening the whole time. I'm sure they would oh. agree. Man. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree. I don't think there was a moment where I had to like kind of look something up or sit and think about it a lot. I think it all makes sense from context. Oh, great. Yeah, I tried to do that. Do you as a reader, like, do you like a glossary of terms? Because I read a lot on my e-reader, I'm far too lazy to flip <laughs> to the back of a book. Um, the only time I ever use a glossary is, or like any kind of supplementary info is when I'm reading like high fantasy and I have no idea what anybody's names are and I have to keep looking them up. But that's my personal, extremely lazy reading style. Yeah, I would agree. I don't usually flip back and forth too much when I'm reading on my Kobo, which is what I do a lot of. But I would also say that I always read whatever is at the end. So if it's in the like in the acknowledgments or something at the back of the book, then I'll still read it for sure. Yeah, I'm kind of the also the same way in terms of not wanting to have to go back and forth and um, consulting. And then there's a part of me is like, you know, like there's Google. So... <laughs> You know, as a you can just Google something to get, you know, a definition also. So anyway, and yeah. You can also within your Kobo, like highlight the word and search it. Right search, yeah. Like the so yeah. Yeah. That's so, very convenient. There you go. 
we also wanted to talk to you a little bit about the different elements of the book. So like you mentioned, they don't really necessarily fit just within historical romance. There's mystery elements as well. So how do you use kind of the mystery scenes and the romance scenes and kind of balance them to create tension? I think that's what makes my books a little complicated to write. There's like multiple plot lines. I mean, yeah, there's a lot of different things going on. And in fact, in the book previous to this, Fiona and the Enigmatic Girl, she's a lady detective and he's a spy and they have both have separate mystery threads as well. So I'd like to, so yeah, balance it. Well, everything has to reveal character. I think that's what it comes down to. It's like, I mean, it's about the crime they're solving. You know, it's about their evolving relationship, but everything is told through character. So it's really about their reactions to everything. Right. And I think that's what brings the mystery and the romance together. But I do when I'm when I'm writing, you know, I'm conscious of like, I can't, you know, the best parts are when the mystery and the romance are going on at the same time, which I have, you know, a lot of. So you're kind of hitting all of those beats simultaneously. So it's a it's a challenge, but I like it. There's wonderful romances out there that are just about the relationship. I'm probably not the writer who could write a hundred thousand words of like no action going on. Um, and that's not typically the kinds of books that I enjoy um, reading as much. Although I know there's, you know, great books out there. There's different kinds of action. It doesn't have to be just mystery and crime solving. So I didn't ask you this up top when we were talking about your writing process, but are you a plotter? Like, do you have to have <laughs> all of this figured out before you go in or do you just wing it and see what happens? Oh my God, that is the age old question, right? I'm not a winger, but I'm definitely not like a hardcore plotter. There's always some germ of an idea that draws me in. So in this book, I mean, I kind of already knew the heroine where she was coming from because she's been in so many books. But I think I always knew like his mystery line and backstory. Like that's kind of what my starting point was for like the whole of the story in terms of plot. But it changes along the way. Like that's the thing with me is like, I will have generally, you know, what I think the first turning point should be, what I think the midpoint should be. But then somewhere along the way, the characters decide to make like some weird detour. And this happens like every single time in multiple places in the book. And so there's a part of me that really thinks that's just the way my brain works. You know, it's kind of an organic plotting process where I have a general framework, but I don't really understand the book until I understand the characters. And it typically takes me a while, you know? So that six to eight months that it takes to write me a book, a lot of it is just kind of getting to know the character. And to be honest, I don't mind that because I like hanging out with my characters. Like I have, you know, I really actually enjoy it and like kind of getting to know them on a deeper level. So yeah, I can't even remember what your initial question was. Oh, plotting versus pantsing. Right? You see, I am not a plotter. I clearly do not know where I am going, um, but somehow I end up there. So, Well, and you mentioned that all of your books take place in the same universe. Do you have like a Grace Calloway's universe almanac of information that you refer back to? Or is yeah, it all in your well, head? A lot. No. So I do have like a document that has stuff in it about all my characters, but a lot of it is also in my head. And what's interesting is sometimes when I think something is like correct and I go back and I look in the document, just be sure it's like, oh, wow, that was way off about this character. You know, like, how did I forget this? But those tend to be more things like physical characteristics. And I'm also, I was always kind of like this as a psychologist as well. Like sometimes I'm not great with names, but I will remember like the details of like the important details of like someone's like history. Like I will always remember that and what they said to me in a session. But I'd be like, oh, I don't know your name. <laughs> Have you ever had any readers point out like a misstep in a character's history that has been like revised in a more recent book? Or do you usually oh. catch them? Yeah, I think I've been lucky to date, but now that I you say that and ask that question, <laughs> I could just see like an email coming into my inbox. That's been fine. There's been some things I've had to, and I usually catch it in the revision. It has to do with like timelines, 
right? Like when people were born and like how old they'd be in relative to someone else when you have like, like and when you've written their parents book, when like, so my last book, Fiona, it's like, I wrote both their parents books. So in different series. So it was just kind of like, okay, I have to get like everything really right. But, you know, I'll just do my best. I hope I haven't jinxed this for you by like putting that <laughs> out into the universe. But kind of speaking about your readers, you have a Facebook group for your readers. The, I want to make sure I get this right. Grace Calloway's Naughty Blue Stockings. Is this yeah. correct? That's such a yeah, great name. Correct. <laughs> Thank you. Can you tell us a little bit about your reader group and what listeners can kind of expect should they join? Oh, it's just like a fun group to hang out. You know, I just post like games and like stuff about my books or just like general reader activities. You know, I do some fun exclusive giveaways and sneak peeks and stuff like that. Um, but it's a really cool group. People are book lovers, historical romance lovers. And it's really nice to see like the community that has been built, you know, people supporting one another and bonding over their love of books, which is a great thing, I think. You also have a newsletter. So how do you use that in your marketing plan? Uh, I think for any aspiring author, this is a very important thing. Everyone should have a newsletter and they should pay attention to it like early on, unlike me. So learn from my mistakes. No, it's great because it's like the one thing, like really when you think about it, that and your website are the things that are like yours. You know, it's your way of keeping in touch with the people who love your books. So, you know, I just, um, I've been actually improving on it steadily. Uh, It's a way to keep in touch with readers. And I do a number of things. There's like, you know, a little bit of personal updates. There's stuff about like my new releases, inspirations that like led to writing books, sales, you know, that kind of thing. And you also have um, your VIP extras as well. So is that different from your regular newsletter? Um, That's just a section on my website that has like some like bonus material and some games and stuff. I'm actually thinking of like changing it and just making that like open to everyone and maybe using the putting the bonus content elsewhere. Yeah, things are always changing, right? With like indie publishing and best practices. So yeah, that's actually an area that I'm probably going to rethink very soon. And it's a little overwhelming when you're indie because so much new stuff comes out all the time, like Patreon and Kickstarter. And it's like, do I do a Patreon? Do I do something else for my VIP readers? So it's a lot. There's always something new, right, to learn And part of it also is like, you know, I've been doing this now, I guess, for like 12, 13 years. And I'm, and this is partly my personality. I'm not the person to be the first to jump on any bandwagon. And then you have to kind of like sift through like what is actually here to stay and like what is actually worth investing your time into. And not only that, I think it's a bit about the fit of like who you are with like this new thing that's happening. I think some of the best advice I've ever been given as a writer is like, you know, work towards your strength, right? Like, don't force yourself to do something that is naturally going to be like, hard and like, unpleasant for you to do. I mean, I shouldn't say that there's some things you should probably always do like a newsletter, for example. But you know, social media is one thing. I mean, I think everyone needs to have some kind of social media presence, but there's lots of ways to do it. Right. So, you know, Facebook is your thing or Instagram or TikTok or whatever it is. Like, I don't think you have to do everything. I think you just need to pick like one or two things and do it well, probably, in my opinion. Has there been any like new, like, so what I'm trying to look for, like new marketing tool or like new way to reach readers throughout your publishing career that you think has been a really big game changer? Oh, that's a hard one. Like throughout my publishing career or what's coming up next? Because I think Either there's or. a lot of things coming down. Yeah. First big revolution was really just like the switch from trad to indie, right? Like you all, like the retailers, that was huge. I mean, without you guys, I wouldn't be doing what, I was, what I'm doing. So thank you, by the way. 
So that's been amazing, that ability to just kind of, you know, reach the public without the barrier of like an in-between, an in-between presence, I guess. You know, social media is for to love it or hate it um, is a big way to get out your book. I mean, you can't ignore what's going on TikTok. I am not yet on TikTok, by the way, because I told you I'm not like the first on any bandwagon. And I, I know it's an amazing tool and some people do it so very well. So I think that's kind of like a big thing coming up. And then I think the next thing coming up, which I'm not sure where it's going to all lead is the stuff with AI, you know that's all frightening, but I'm sure there's also opportunity in it. So, you know. Yeah. The AI stuff that's coming out is wild. Yeah. And I think it has the potential only to change the whole writing landscape, but pretty much every profession out there. And then in a larger existential sense, like the course of like humankind, but we don't need to get into that in this, this podcast. This Um, is why we're all reading romance books. (laughs) And not really? watching Terminator anymore. <laughs> yeah. We know Skynet is online, people. And like, we've seen, we've all seen this movie, right? It's like, and then I also saw somewhere like, are they bringing back the Dodo Bird? I'm like, you have seen Jurassic Park, right? Like, <laughs> I'm like, I'm not the only one who's seen these movies. But anyway, I guess we shall see what happens. Yeah, let's listen to Steven Spielberg and James Cameron, guys, and let's leave AI and dinosaurs alone. <laughs> <laughs> The twist ending our listeners were not expecting. (laughs) Before we wrap up, can you give us kind of a hint about what you're working on next? Oh, well, I allude a little bit to it at the end of this current book. So the next story is Charlie's story. And for those who haven't read along the series, she's, uh, well, it's her angel. So she's pretty much like the head of the agency. And she has her own past and her own mystery and romance to deal with. So that is my next book, Charlotte and the Seductive Spymaster. That's a good title. Thanks. Yeah, I have a pretty good idea. Um, I was actually, it's funny, at my retreat, I was plotting this book in the hot tub, which became known as the plot tub. And one of the women... I love that. (laughs) It is the greatest thing, right? And one of the women brought us waterproof scribbling tablets. I've never seen that before, but you can like write, it's like waterproof paper. And so you can actually sit and like write stuff while you're in the hot tub. This could be a game changer for writing (laughs) retreats. I think everyone should lead with this for conferences next year. (laughs) Yeah, that's my game changer. It's not AI, it's waterproof like writing tablets, guys. That's where it's at. Yeah, we we didn't have to get that complicated, guys. We could have just gone with (laughs) waterproof (laughs) paper. And before we let you go, where can listeners find you online? Oh, they can find my website, which is gracecalloway.com. My newsletter, you can also sign up via my website, but it's very simple. It's just also gracecalloway.com slash newsletter. And, you know, on face, I'm I'm pretty much everywhere except for TikTok right now. So I'm on Instagram. If you want to find me, Grace Calloway Books, that's the same handle on Facebook as well. Amazing. We will include links to all those in the show notes so listeners can find you. And Grace, thank you so much for joining us today. This was so lovely. Oh, this was so much fun. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Grace. This has been great. Thank you for listening to the Kobo Writing Life Podcast. If you are interested in picking up Grace's books, we will include links in our show notes. If you are enjoying this podcast, please be sure to rate, review, and subscribe. And if you're looking for more tips on growing your self-publishing business, you can find us at kobowritinglife.com. And be sure you are following us on socials. We are at Kobo Writing Life on Facebook and Twitter and at kobo.writing.life on Instagram. This episode was hosted by Laura Granger and Rachel Wharton with production by Terrence Abrahams. Editing is provided by Kelly Robotham. Our theme music is composed by Tearjerker. And thanks to Grace Calloway for being a guest. If you're ready to start your publishing journey, sign up today at kobo.com slash writing life. Until next time, happy writing. <laughs>